Happy Sabbath. That was a very special music. And um, we need to continue to pray for Ukraine and the lives that are being lost in this senseless war. And um, I want to thank Elder Phillips for the invitation to be here and to share a word with us this Sabbath morning. Um, I'm expecting a PowerPoint to appear miraculously behind me. There we go. There we go. So, and before we get into the um, sermon itself, I want to just alight you to some of the things that are happening in and around this area. Um, we have a, what's called a remnant brunch that we meet once a month. A brunch is different from a sermon. In the sermon, I preach, you listen, very little interaction. Um, but when you have a brunch, we sit down, we discuss issues pertinent to our preparations for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We can sit down and debate it. And even because it's on a Sunday, we can even discuss non-sabbatical issues and topics and, and the questions that we have. We can d discuss these and prepare ourselves for what is going to transpire. So our next one is in August, August 21st, and it'll be at the Sebring SDA Church. And then um, the one in September will, I, will actually be at the Highlands Hammock State Park. We'll be going on a foraging hike, foraging hike, finding out what sort of plants and fruits and berries and mushrooms we can eat out in the wild. Okay, that's September the 11th. And then I want to remind you that we have our camp meeting. So the thing about a sermon is that I preach and you listen. A brunch, we can discuss things. But at a camp meeting, we have four days of worship and training and discussions and debates about issues relevant to our preparations for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So our camp meeting is in October, October 7th to 11th. We'll have Pastor James Rafferty from 3ABN. He'll be our main speaker. We'll also be having a host of other ministries come down and perform various training and discussions and lectures from medical missionary work to apologetics to um, prepare how to move to the country and all these other topics okay i want to remind you this is our website that we use and any information about any of the programs that we're running is on this website wilderness survival camp dot com wilderness survival camp dot com registration forms um, details about any of the programs are on that website and previous sermons Future sermons will be on this YouTube channel, Pastor Robert Hines. Um, just look for Pastor Robert Hines on YouTube and you'll find it there. And I'll be pulling down the one from today and putting that on there in a couple of days' time as well. So, uh, next week I'll be preaching in Frostproof. We're talking about how to develop an incredible communication with God. And then the week after we'll also be in Frostproof and we'll be talking about... And the Sunday Law Part 3. The Sunday Law Part 3. Okay. Any questions so far? No. That's okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to show you a video as an introduction to our sermon. The audio is not very good on it, so you're going to have to listen very carefully. And it's something that um, Sylvia Allen's Spoke. She's a senator for Arizona and for the 6th District in Arizona. And it's during a debate, and this was taken from 2015. Um, but listen to what she says. Uh, let's make sure we have some audio. Back to having a moral rebirth. 
Did you kind of catch what she said? Did you hear it? She, she was, she's addressing some issue of violence and guns and knife, and she's, she's lambasting the moral decadence in Arizona. And she's saying, you know, to solve this, we need to be discussing a bill. And the bill that relates to everybody going to church on a Sunday. Did you hear it? Okay. This is continuing to go on. This underlying debate and discussion about a coming Sunday law. A coming Sunday law. This is a reality that we as Adventists have to prepare ourselves for. Amen? We cannot be like ostriches who bury their heads in the sand hoping it's never going to happen. It will happen because the Bible says it will. And God never lies. So, in the UK, ooh, I don't know what happened there. There we go. That wasn't me. Okay. In the UK, we had some good news recently. Um, our ladies football team won the European um, Championships. They beat, they beat Germany, and we won the, the, our ladies won the football, soccer, I should say, soccer. Uh, let's not get it confused. <laughs> they won the soccer ch um, championship, European Cup. Okay? Why am I telling you this? Because Iceland is a major supermarket chain in England. The championship was going to be played, the finals were going to be played in England on a Sunday. And it, the championship started at 5 in the evening. Iceland decided to close all their stores early on that day. Early. So that all the workers could go home and watch the finals. And then as a result, there is now this discussion, should this closure continue? In, um, what is it? Uh, in Malaysia, do you know what ecumenicalism is? Let me just make sure that you're, you're okay with that. Okay. Are we for ecumenicalism? No, no. Ecumenicalism leads to compromise. Always leads to compromise. Ecumenicalism leads to compromise. They say, let's forget the differences and let's unite around our, our, our commonalities. So ecumenicalism is always dangerous. In fact, um, Elder Ted Wilson at the GC session um, just a few months ago, preached his sermon, or Sabbath sermon, and he mentioned it twice, how we as Seventh-day Adventists should steer away from ecumenicalism. And then we have this happening. A large group of ecumenical, ecumenical clergy from all over, over Malaysia, Sarawak province gathered to pray, sing, and worship together. In the Christian Ecumenical Worship Center on July the 21st, 2022, believers from the Roman Catholic and Anglican Seventh-day Adventist, Evangelical, Methodist, the Salvation Army, Baptist, and even some indigenous faiths gathered shoulder to shoulder. And the article goes on. This is, uh, we've seen a lot more of this coming together. Let's all worship. Let's forget about these differences, these minor differences, so we can become one. This is a dangerous trend, a dangerous trend. Please remember what happened to the nation of Israel when they started to embrace Baal worship and Asherah poles. Remember what happened to them and how they were eventually this, um, removed from their promised land and ended up in slavery. So, with that being said, let me say another word of prayer. Father God, we want to thank you there, Lord. 
that you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. That means we have to have light. We have to have truth. And we have to follow in your way. So we pray there, Lord, that you'll make these three things evident before us today. Speak to us so that we can be your disciples. We pray there, Lord, that your Holy Spirit be here. Be with me and the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts so that everything will be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, we're in a series about last day events. Last day events, and I want to... How many of you actually believe that we're nearing the end of time? Okay. Hopefully this is a reality for you. We are very close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. When I was a boy, I thought of it, yes, he's going to come. But I thought way down in the future. Okay. Perhaps I'm way down in the future now, but, it's, but it seems very much like the second coming of Jesus Christ is imminent, even at the door. So in this series that we've, I've been going through, and you, you can get the rest on YouTube, we've learned certain things. We've learned that history repeats itself. We learned that God always gives signs to foretell what he's going to be doing. We learned about the judgment and how we're in a time of judgment. We learned about the remnant church and the Lady of Sion church and, and the shaking that occurs, the difficulty that separates the wheat from the tears. We've learned about revival and reformation and how the re reformation precedes revival. We learned about forgiveness, the latter rain, the loud cry. And last time I preached in this series, we talked about the Sunday Law Part 1. So today we're looking at the Sunday law. We're going to give another aspect of this Sunday law issue. Our memory verse is this. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. That's some bold talking. <laughs> some bold talk. This is a type of talk that we all need to exhibit. So, um, this is a time chart. Ho hopefully you've seen similar things to this time chart that we're working our way through. We should know every aspect on this time chart as, as, as Adventists. We should know every detail on it because we are people of the book. We study, we research, and we learn. We should know this time chart. And um, we are right here this is what we're going to be doing, the Sunday law. And below it, in that black strip, which you probably can't see, it says this, probation closes for the church. Probation closes for the church. And when I mean the church, I'm talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. Probation closes at the Sunday law for the church. Not for the world, for the church. When the death decree is issued... That's the general close of probation for everybody else. Probation closes for us first. And if you missed that, you need to watch some of the sermons that we've been going through. Okay? This is why it says this. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be? So the final events of earth are going to happen very quickly. 
How many of you think that time is speeding up? <laughs> I, I, I genuinely believe. I mean, the weeks just fly by. They just fly by. Time is speeding up. But despite how we feel about time now, what we are told is that the final events are going to happen very quickly. So much so that all these events that we've seen on the time chart are going to be overlapping. The shaking, the revival and reformation, the loud cry, the ceiling, the early time of trouble, the latter rain, all these things are virtually going to be overlapping each other. Not, it won't be one, and then there's a pause, and then the next one, and then there's a pause, and the next one. No, all these events are going to happen almost simultaneously. So we need to be ready for them, because by the time these things start to occur, if you're not ready, you are lost. Listen carefully. By the time these things occur, if you haven't made your election and calling sure you are lost. Now's the time for us to get ready. So, in the Sunday Law Part 1, we went through certain things. We learnt about the definition. We learnt about its origins in the United States. We learnt about the purpose of this Sunday law and what they want to achieve with it. We learnt about Sunday laws in the past and the history of Sunday laws. And we learnt about the shaking that will occur during the Sunday law crisis. Now we're going to be heading down the other side of the chart. But we'll only be talking about one thing. Point number six, the church's response to the Sunday law. That's all we're going to talk about today. Okay. In part three, we'll deal with everything else. The doubt is the beast, the seal of God, and, and preparation. But we do, we're just going to be talking about the church's response to the Sunday law. So what is the Sunday law? The Sunday law is this. It's, it's the national Sunday law is a federal law enforcing Sunday as a day of rest and then a day of worship. Then is, it, is, it should be said, it is then followed by a universal Sunday law. Okay. So first of all, they say everybody has to rest on Sunday. I don't have a problem with that. Anybody else have a problem with that? No, I can rest. I can rest on Sunday. But what then they say, no, we want to take it a step further, and we want you to actually worship on Sunday. This is when there's going to be a rub. Because we don't worship the way they worship. Okay? That's when there's going to be some friction. And then this Sunday law that starts first in America spreads out across the world. And it'll get to the point where there is no place in the world without a Sunday law. It will truly be a universal Sunday law. Now, there are some people, this is next week, there are some people who doubt that it's ever going to happen. But just think, the COVID vaccines were universal. Were universal. All the way around the world. Anyway, Let's move on. So let's talk about the church's response to the Sunday law. And in, in order for us to think about how our church is going to respond to the Sunday law, we have to first paint a picture of the situation the church finds itself in. So, first of all, so what is the current situation at the time of the Sunday law in which our church finds itself in? Matthew 24 verse 9 says this, Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now this has partial fulfillment in years gone by, but it's going to have its complete fulfillment in years to come, in time, days to come, in months, weeks to come, because all nations will hate the Seventh-day event is a remnant people of God because they will not follow the Sunday law. Listen, listen to how they're going to treat us. You, they're going to be afflicted. They will kill you. They should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Okay? 
So that's the situation as Jesus depicts it about the last days and the Sunday law. Everybody is going to hate you. Everybody's going to hate you. Everybody's going to hate you. Mrs. White says this in Last Day Events. Seventh-day Adventists will fight the battle over the Seventh-day Sabbath. The authorities in the United States and in other countries will rise up in their pride and power and make laws to restrict religious liberty. So there will be laws saying that you can't worship on Sabbath. You can't worship the God that you want in the way that you want. They're going to rise up and make these laws. Um, soon the Sunday laws will be enforced and men in positions of trust will be embittered against the little handful of God's commandment keeping people. So even though we're a small minority, a remnant of a remnant, a small group, they are going to hate us because we are determined to keep all of God's commandments fully. Revelation 13 verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had a mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So we see religious liberty being restored. We've seen laws being set up, restricting us. We're also seeing that we cannot buy or sell. There'll be no transactions that we are able to make because we will not take the mark of the beast and worship on Sunday. So this is the situation the church finds itself in. Miss White says this, there is time coming when commandment keepers can neither buy nor sell. And she goes on to say in Desire of Ages, in the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers. They will be forbidden to buy or sell. You're hated, persecuted, they're going to try to kill you, you've got no earthly support, you cannot buy or sell. This is a situation the church of God finds itself in in the last days. So, let me give you a question. Okay, ma'am? You got a question. This is the question. You're the president of the Florida Conference. Okay? You're president of the conference. And all this is happening around you. Okay? All this is happening around you. Okay? You have two choices. Either you comply with the government mandates. Either you comply with the government mandates and worship on Sunday and encourage your churches to worship on Sunday. Or you oppose the government mandates. Okay? Those are your two choices. Now what are you going to do? How many are going to comply? Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Nobody. There are some, there are, oh, wanna, wanna, how many of you are going to oppose the government mandates? Okay, okay. Let's see what happens because you've made a decision. Let's see what's going to happen with your decision. Okay. Okay. So if you comply, this is what you've got come in. First of all, you can continue operating as a church. You can continue. If you comply and do what the government tells you to do, you can continue operating as a church. You can buy, you can sell, you can clear your offerings, you can do your business and trade and do whatever. You can continue operating as a church. However, the remnant people of God are shaken out from that situation. Because how many remnant-minded people will stay in an organization 
that has complied with the Sunday law. Think about it. Think about it. Okay, that's one option. The other, if you oppose the government mandate and say, no, we will not stand up, we will not bow down and worship your gods. If you get all Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on them. <laughs> this is what's coming your way. Then the government will cease you cease force you to cease operations okay and because we are 501c3 they can seize all our assets as well okay so every church building this one as well any church vehicles anything else they'll be able to seize and see and force us to stop operations however in that case the true Adventists, sorry, the remnant remain in the church, but the fake Adventists, that's why it's air quotes, are shaken out of the church. Okay? Those who would compromise are shaken out of the church. So this is, where, this is a situation that the church will find itself in in the future. Either we oppose or we comply. So, what do you think the church is going to do? Well, let's look at its track record. Let's see how the church has been operating. Okay, when it came to the vaccines and the mandates for the vaccine, did the, did the church comply or oppose? It complied. Even though some members went through a very hard time because they personally chose. Okay? What about LGBTQ plus? Do we comply or do we oppose? We complied. And in fact, at Loma Linda University, the president said, said this. He said, Jesus Christ wants us to celebrate gay, no, wants us to celebrate Pride Month. Yes. The president of Loma Linda University said that. What about meat eating? Okay, let me break it down. In our Adventist hospitals, in our Seventh day Adventist hospital, okay, um, is, is there meat eating in our hospitals? Oh my days. In fact, you can get unclean meats in, in our hospitals. You can. You can. You can get your order of pizza and all, all some pepperoni on it in our Adventist hospitals. Back in Mrs. White days, it was a debate whether you should have meat or not. But now we've settled that. It's a you can have meat and you can even have unclean meats. What about um, ecumenicalism? Well, we've seen from the video and from the news report that we've already taken many stands towards reaching out and embracing the faith of other people. In fact, in fact, in the general conference, there's a, a, one of the vice presidents, uh, Mr. Diep, who's in charge of public affairs and religious liberties, who meets with the Pope and other religious leaders and worships with them on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So this is our track record. Okay? This is what's happened already. Okay? Now let's look at what we are saying. Are we telling our, our members to move to the country, as Mrs. White said? Do, you, do, you, do we hear that? Is it coming down from the presidents and say, members, it's time for us to leave the cities and move to the countries? Did you receive an email from the GC president and say, get out of the cities, abandon the wickedness, get set up in the... No. Do you hear us saying that we should be having a plant-based diet? Sort of, kind of, sometimes. I think it's, sometimes it's a struggle even to be um, vegetarian, to get a vegetarian meal. And um, for many of the pastors, a lot of the pastors are still meat eaters. 
as long as the pastors are still meat eaters. Do you hear anything about dress reform? Do you hear anything about health reform? Or worship reform? Or medical missionary work as a right hand of the gospel and, and the entering wedge? These are the messages that we should be pushing out to our people. So the messages that are being sent, these are going against our principles. And the messages that should be sent are not being sent. Are not being sent. So, in this situation, a message for you. We need to fully support the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen? But don't trust it. Okay? That sounds really radical. It does, isn't it? Okay? We must fully support the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but don't trust it. Okay? I'm going to explain why. Okay? Many of you Americans... Okay, yes, you're proud. Okay, do you fully support your country? You fully support your country, don't you? Do you trust it? <laughs> it's the same way. You can fully support something, be all out, be a proud American, but not trust it. You may not trust a political system or some of the decision it makes. You don't trust it. But you're a proud American. So it's okay to fully support, but not trust. Okay. Is this biblical? Let's read some verses, because some of you are looking at me like, oh man, this guy is a heretic. I can see, I can see the look in your eye. Let's read. Okay. Psalms 118, verse 9. Okay. Who was the book of Psalms written, most of it written by? And some of it was written by Moses. Both of them leaders in and of themselves, in their own rights. This is what they said as leaders. Psalms 118 verse 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in princes. Princes are leaders. The ruling class. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put your trust in princes. Psalms 146 verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Don't trust the political elite. Trust God. Let me give you two other um, verses as well. 2 Kings 18 verse 21. Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. What's this message about? This message is a message to the nation of Judah, who is caught in between Egypt and Babylon as, as the superpowers of their time. And they're wondering, which way should we go? If we, let's rebel against Let's rebel against Babylon and hopefully Egypt will come up and help us. That's their thinking. And the prophet is saying, don't trust on Egypt. It's like a bruise, it's like a reed that's splintered and it's going to pierce your hand when you lean upon it. And the very same message is given by Isaiah in Isaiah 36 verse 6. Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. The message is very clear. The message is very clear. We support the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is the remnant church of God. There is no other denomination that we can go to. This is it. But the actual, so we support, but the actual trusting, we only trust in God. Only trust in God. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be he followers of Oh, Paul's asking us to follow him. <laughs> but he gives a caveat. 
He gives a caveat. He says, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So basically, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, he's also saying, if I stop following Christ, don't follow me. If I go against anything that is unbiblical or not true, stop following me. In other words, we have to know the truth, and we have to know the God of the truth, and we can follow Paul as long as he's following Christ. We can follow our leaders as long as they are following Christ. Amen? Have I removed all doubt? Hopefully. Ephesians 6 verse 1. Children... Come on, parents, you know this off by heart. <laughs> Come on, you know it. <laughs> you know it. I know you know it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Okay, in the Lord. You can obey your parents in the Lord. That means anything your parents tell you to do, you will do it as long as it is in the Lord. So if your parents say, we're going to go into Walmart now, and I want you to take these candies and put them in your pocket, and we'll just walk out. Is that in the Lord? It's not in the Lord. So as children, you have every right to disobey your parents in that circumstance. Because they are not leading you right. You only obey in the Lord. Romans 13, 1-7. And this is a, a very long passage. Well, seven verses. You can read it later at your leisure. Where Paul is telling us to obey government authorities because it, God gave them the right to be rulers obey them obey them and the caveat and the understanding is still the same you can obey them as long as their laws do not counteract go against the law of God so when the speeding limit says speed limit says 55 miles per hour how fast should we be driving up to 55 okay because that's the law, amen? Some of you are like, oh, well. <laughs> hey, that's, that's, that's what he says, okay? Up to 55, okay? If, if we go against it, we're breaking the law. But if the, if, the law of the law say, if the law of the land says, you need to worship on Sunday, this is when we will knowingly break the law of the land. Amen? So, think about Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees. Think about all the people. We know that the scribes and Pharisees oppose Jesus. We know that. But what about the ordinary people? If they followed the leadership of their church, what would they have done? they would have rejected Jesus. If they followed the leadership, they would have rejected Jesus. But because they saw for themselves the marvelous works of God, and they heard the truth broken down for them, they believed in Jesus and opposed the scribes and the Pharisees. Mrs. White says this, the scriptures foretell a great apostasy which even in the days of the apostles had begun to manifest itself among certain false brethren in the church and which finally was to develop into a falling away and the revelation of that man of sin, the son of perdition, of whom Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. So Mrs. White is talking about a reference from Thessalonians about a falling away. She goes on to say this, the church may appear as about to... How many of you have read this, have heard of this quote before? Okay. So let's break it down. The church may appear as to about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the synod in Zion's will be 
sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal. But nevertheless, it must take place. Talking about our church. Talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. The Seventh-day Adventist church appears as about to fall. But it does not. It remains while the sifting goes on. And the sifting is terrible. But it has to take place to separate the wheat from the tears. Let's dig a little deeper into this text. So what does it mean to fall? Because the church appears to fall. What does it mean to fall? Well, we know of a phrase that says, Babylon has, has fallen. It's repeated twice. Paul, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Okay? We know about that. Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's repeated twice because it's absolutely clear that it's happened. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, fallen, fallen. And is become the habitations of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So this fallen state of Babylon is messed up. It, what's living in it is foul, detestable, corrupt, evil. It's fallen, it's fallen. This is a description of the beast of the Roman Catholic Church. Jude 1 6 also says this And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness and to the judgment of the great day. These are a group of angels, and these angels are called the fallen angels. Agreed? We describe those angels as angels that have fell. They're fallen. Okay. So fallen means this. Complete and irreversible spiritual, moral, mental, physical, and emotional decline and degradation. Total ruin. So when we think back about the papacy, at this time in prophecy, where Babylon is fallen, it's fallen, the papacy is doing very, very well. It's like a world superpower. It's, 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 it's controlling the kings of the earth and the merchants of the world. It's controlling them. It's at the, the zenith of its power. But the description of it is this, it's fallen, it's fallen. So even though it's at its zenith of its power and influence, morally, spiritually, it's gone beyond any repair. So now let's take this and apply it to our quote. The church may appear as about to, okay, not fallen, fall. It's going to fall. It's in the process of falling, but it hasn't fallen, okay? It appears to fall, but it does not fall. Okay? And how does God keep it from falling, becoming completely fallen? He does it via the shaking. He does it via the shaking. The corrupting influences in our church. The shaking occurs and separates them out of the church, leaving a pure remnant people and this pure remnant people keeps the church from becoming fallen and in fact raises up the church and the church goes on to pronounce the loud cry and finish the work any questions any questions so what we're seeing here in our day and age is a process 
where the church is being sifted and shaken. And it's a sift and shaken that's important to keep the church from becoming totally fallen. Matthew 30 verse 30 says this, let, them, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather he together first the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. This is the separation of the wheat and the tears. That shaking period that is unpleasant but so essential if it doesn't occur the church will go the same way as Israel and Judah and become completely fallen God has to separate the wheat from the tears and then the wheat the true remnant people of God the 144,000 will go on and finish the work If all that appears to be divine life was such in reality, if all who profess to present the truth to the world were preaching for the truth and not against it, and if they were men of God guided by his spirit, then might we see something cheering amid the prevailing moral darkness. But the spirit of Antichrist is prevailing to such an extent as never before testimony to the churches a message about our church that even in our church there is a falling that is occurring a falling that is occurring things that we should be standing up for we are not things that we should be advocating and promoting we are not Things that we should be speaking out against, we are not. But there is a, a, a movement to become like the world. Liberalization in worship, in dress, in, in, in the way we do things. Becoming more and more like Babylon rather than against Babylon. Well... May we exclaim, help Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. This is, this is rather like um, Elijah when he says, and I'm the only one that's left. <laughs> Who's trying to serve. They're trying to kill me as well. This is a similar sort of sentiment. Help Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from Hey, my brother on the PowerPoint. Hello. My brother on the PowerPoint at the back. We need the right screen. There we go. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that many think far too favor favorably of the present time. These ease-loving souls will be engulfed in the general ruin. Yet we do not despair. We have been inclined to think that, were there, uh, that there are no faithful ministers, there can be no true Christian. But this is not the case. So even though, even though you may not have a leader who is present truth, who is speaking the truth, it doesn't mean that the members have to follow that way. The members can learn and study for themselves. Because we do not rely on any leader, but God. God is our leader. God has promised that there were, sorry, God has promised that where the shepherds are not true, he will take charge of the flock himself. Amen? God has never made the flock wholly dependent upon human instrumentalities. But the days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. God will have a people 
pure and true. These days of purification are the days of sifting or the shaking or the separation of the wheat and tares. And she says, that is gathering pace. It's coming, it's coming. Even though our church may have blemishes and is imperfect, this is the church of God though. And it's going to purify her with or without the ministers on board, with or without the leader, he's going to raise up a group of remnant-minded people who will finish the work. In Testimonies, Volume 5, in the mighty sifting soon to take place, we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that his fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. It's my belief, church, that we are now living in the beginning of the sifting, shaking time. We are living in the sifting, shaking time. It's going to intensify and get a lot worse as we start to see the Sunday law more and more talked about and then discussed and then become a law. But we are in the time of the beginning of the sifting and shaking. And please remember, by the time the Sunday law is passed, probation for the church has closed. Now is our time to make up our mind whose side we're on. Now is that time. Don't wait to the Sunday law. Because it's too late then for believers. So... Daniel chapter 3, incredible story, fantastic children's story, but a children's story that's so pertinent to our days and for us. So, in Daniel chapter 3 verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jury in the province of Babylon. Why? Because he wanted to defy the commandment of God, the plan of God. Remember, God said that Babylon was going to come to an end. Nebuchadnezzar set himself up, his own religion, in defiance of God's plan. And he used religion and worship as a tool to gauge loyalty. Listen carefully. He used religion and worship as a tool to measure the loyalty of his leadership. The same will happen today. Verse 4 and 5. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nat nations and languages, that at what time he hear the sound of the Cornet, flute, harp, sackwet, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. He fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has set up. I, I want you to worship regardless of what religion you think you have. Worship my religion. No matter what language you speak, you're going to do what I tell you to do. No matter what nation you come from, you are going to comply. If you want your job... Do as you're told. If you want your next paycheck, if you want life to get back to normal, if you want things to continue the way they are, just comply with my decrees. This is a message. And if you don't, I've got a way of persuading you. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So if you don't do as you're told, there are consequences. There are consequences. So in this we see certain facets that are going to be repeated in the last days. First of all, we see that man is defeated Defying the laws of God. God says to keep the Sabbath day holy, the seventh day of the week. They say, no, we can worship on a Sunday. And there's going to be a defiance, known disobedience to the law of God. Secondly, it's going to be 
uh, a test of loyalty between uh, um, for the leadership for everybody. It's going to be this incredible test of loyalty. There's going to be this ecumenical movement and and a fraternity. You know, um, the Pope's um, encyclical, the Pope encyclical Fratelli Tutti. That's the one, Fratelli Tutti. I'm not so good with the Latin. Sorry. The Brotherhood of Believers, there's going to be this loyalty that spans across nationalities, languages, and, and people groups, and religion. And we're seeing it even today. There's several Muslim states, listen church, there's several Muslim nations, Pakistan, Dubai, and a few others, that have now made Sunday a day of rest. They've extended their weekend from Friday all the way through to Sunday. Did you know that? Because Muslims worship on a Friday. And their weekend was Friday and Saturday. And now they've extended it all the way through to Sunday as well. If I was a Muslim nation, I would have made Thursday uh, an extra day of rest. But they've made Sunday to comply with the rest of the world. The rest of the world. There is worship. And worship and sign of worship. And if you don't do it, you're going to die. And Mrs. White says, the Bible says, any organization or structure that uses threats is not of God. God never threatens anyone. He gives you a choice. Do what you want to do. Okay? But he never threatens anybody to do it his way. So, this is going to be a test of our character. And we need to have the character, our character ready at this time to be able to stand up against a worldwide decree to worship on a Sunday. And so just as much as this was a character test for the Hebrews, they developed their character over the period of time. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar said this, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that ye serve not, that ye serve not my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I, we're not going to mince our words. We're going to say it like it is. Call a spade a spade. Okay. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. They are not questioning the ability of God. Please note. Our God can save you. He is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not worship, not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And he says, but if it's God's will that we die, let it be. We would rather die serving God than live disobeying him. So this is a real test, a real test, and we're all going to come to this test. Jeremiah says this, if racing against men, men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? If you stumble and fall on open ground, what will you do in the thickets near the Jordan? What is Jeremiah saying here? If you can't cope with life now and the small test you're facing now, how are you going to cope during the Sunday law? Really? If you're finding being an, an Adventist difficult now, how are you going to cope when they're threatening your life or your mama's life or your children's life? How are you going to cope then? And that is why Daniel 1 precedes Daniel 3. And in Daniel 1, they had to make a stand for their faith then. You can't wait to the last minute to make a stand for your faith. You've got to do it beforehand. You understand what I'm saying? 
There's many Adventists for, yeah, when the Sunday law come, I'll just, I'll make a stand then. No, you've got to develop the character to make a stand now. You've got to do this now. So when Daniel and his friends had the opportunity to eat these unclean foods, because they were going to be slaves. They're slaves anyway. Goodness, what rights did they have? They were slaves. They should be grateful they had a meal. But they say, no, no, no. We don't want to eat anything that's unclean. Just give us some beans, some water. That's cool. So God prepared them, and he's also preparing us as well. He is. He's preparing us. He's preparing us to make a stand in the last days. So he, he's allowing us to go through difficulties now. He's allowing us to go through hard times now. Why? Because when you learn to trust God in these smaller hard times, now you're more able to make a stand when the Sunday law comes. So whether it's through money or Sabbath keeping or, or your health or relationship or a host of other things, God is bringing us to certain testing points in our lives. And these testing points are opportunities to grow in trust and faith. God doesn't just want to spring the Sunday law on you and go, Pada, there you go. No. He wants to grow you and prepare you so you can meet that test and pass it. That's how merciful our God is. He knows the future. He knows what you need. And he says, well, Betty needs this. Let me bring her to this test. Let me allow her to get sick here and she'll get through that. Let her get, bring her to this financial crisis. Let there be a bit of rocky period in her marriage and stuff like that. He's going to bring her through these things so that when the Sunday law comes, Betty, who's been trusting in God all the way along, can stand firm because she knows her God is able. So we've got to lean into our trials. We've got to lean into our difficulties. And when we find a difficulty, we need to say, yes, Lord, I praise you for my difficulty. <laughs> yes, Lord, I praise you for it because I know this is another opportunity to grow in faith and trust in you. God is preparing us for that last time, especially when we realize that the organizational structure of the church may collapse but we will be able to stand because we trust in God so I want you to take a note of this because I may have just lied to you from left right and center and you don't know so you got to check it out I want you to read some stuff there's a book called end the end of time how to prepare read chapter 5 uh, testimonies to the churches, read volume 5, chapter 5, um, read early writings, part of the preface, page um, 17, and um, Christ's object lessons, read ch chapters 4 and 10. Okay? You need to study, 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 read, read, read. Never believe what the preacher says. Check it out. Check it out for yourself. I could have lied, sister. I'm telling you, I could have lied. But you don't know unless you're a Berean. And you've got to study for yourself to see, is this actually true? Is this actually true? It may sound true, but you don't know. So take a note for yourself, read it, research it. So the first book you may not know, The End of Time, How to Prepare. And this is what it looks like. The End of Time, How to Prepare. Okay? great book and it's just full of Mrs. White's quotes it's I forget the publisher it's not remnant publishing it's maybe harvest publishing I think it is okay but if you look at it that's the book you want the end of time how to prepare and it's lots of it's got all the end time um, phases and Mrs. White quotes relating to all of them so you can know what relates to what okay our memory verse is this. I want, and I want us really to be like Shadrach, Misham, and Abednego when it gets to the end times. If it be so, our God whom we serve is 
able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, we want you to know, O king, that we will never serve your gods, nor worship the golden image, the Sunday law, which you have set up. It's my prayer, my desire, that when we all face this test, that we will all pass with flying colors. 